Welcome to the Dignity Dialogue with your host, Joe Kittinger. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to the Dignity Dialogues. Uh, I'm your host today, April Johnson. And as you can see, I'm one short. We don't have Joe with us today. Uh, He is on vacation. So we're going to have a little fun. Okay. I know you guys can. All right. Well, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to have our guest with us today. Looking forward to this conversation with Michelle Bursell. And uh, and I just, Michelle, I'm so glad that you're with us today. I'm so glad that you decided to take a little time and, and chat with me a little bit about empowerment um, and also the connection between our emotions and the, the world of mental health right now, too. I think it's such a, a valuable thing to be talking about right now. And, um, and we need to be talking about it more, quite frankly. Uh, there, I said it. <laughs> we need to be talking about yes, it more. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm excited to have you with us here. Um, so Michelle, I'm going to let you just jump right in. I would love for you to just tell us a little bit about yourself and, and, um, and what you do and who you are a little bit. Wonderful. Thank you, April. And thank you so much for having me on the Dignity Dialogue. I love what you're doing. And really, it, it, it it's so great to meet people that are on the same page of wanting to support people to be their best selves, lead as the, their best selves. And really, we're on this trajectory with leadership to know thyself, right? The more we know ourselves, the better we can lead and support others and, and support ourselves. And the message that I teach with emotional empowerment is that our emotions are there to help us do just that, to help us know ourselves better and really to help us grow. And so our emotions and our emotional well-being can really be a proactive approach to addressing uh, challenges that we're experiencing internally so they don't build and build and turn into emotional weight that could ultimately turn into mental health challenges that so many are struggling with. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Thank you for that. Um, I know everybody's got a story, and I know that you have a story of kind of how you came into doing what you're doing Um, This hasn't been the thing that you've always been doing. Um, And I would love to hear a little bit of your history. Just how did you come into doing what you're doing? Sure. Thank you for asking. So I was trained as a psychotherapist and knew a lot of tools, just about every tool (laughs) under the sun to get rid of negative feelings. Um, But I consider myself an empath, someone who's emotionally sensitive And despite having all these tools, what I found was I would get rid of a negative feeling and then it would just come back. And this could be maybe a month later and on a, you know, a good month, but oftentimes it was the next day or a few hours later. And it was really frustrating. It was very uh, upsetting. Uh, I wanted to be able to help myself and help others. And I just felt that uh, the tools, while they could be helpful to calm and kind of manage emotions, to me, they were not getting to the root of what was causing these emotions to come forward. And so my work really progressed in where, uh, where I developed this process of wanting to, rather than uh, learn how to get rid of What is the meaning behind what we are feeling? And how can I turn these negative emotions into allies since I am seemingly a person (laughs) that experiences a lot of emotion and is very tuned to emotion? There had to be a reason. And once this switch kind of flipped for me, where I could start to see that my sadness was there to help guide me to more of my truth. My anger was there to help me step into more of healthy power. Mm. My anxiety was there to really help me to to have greater peace. When these when this started coming through and I learned how to work with my emotions in that way, it blew me away because uh, because 
that was not my experience with my emotions. My emotions would be ruminating if I was anxious. It was the furthest away from experiencing peace. And so to learn how to understand how they are our guides, supporting us to, again, know ourselves and grow into more of who we're meant to be, it changes everything. Yeah, I love that. Oh my gosh, you're totally speaking my language, girl. You're totally <laughs> speaking my language. Um, that whole idea, you know, there's so many people that they want to be better. Um, and, and we've talked to many people that really strive for that. But until they start to understand the why behind why, you know, why am I feeling the way that I feel? And why does it not go away? Or why does it, you know, flare up all the time? As soon as we we start to approach that why, um, you see so you see so much growth in people. Um, but I think sometimes, right, people are a little afraid to kind of go there, you know? And so we just, we spend a lot of time kind of pushing our feelings out of the way, you know, sh- pushing some things under the, under the rug, if you will, hoping that, that it won't flare up in, in the middle of something important or right. Or like go to work right. and just don't think about it, you know? Um, and the reality is, is that we're emotional beings. We're, we're born this way. We're created this way. Um, and that thought that we can just shut it all off and, and, just be what everybody expects or what you think everybody expects from you, right? It's just a myth. And it puts us in a place um, of just, it puts us in a place of unrest. It It does. So I I love that that you talk a little bit about that and that whole idea of the why. Um, When you talk about emotional empowerment, like I went, I I have some notes. I have notes, of course, because (laughs) I live off of notes. Um, But when you talk about emotional empowerment, you know, I really resonated with that, with that word. And because I love to empower others. It's one of the things that I I feel like as a leader, I'm really called to, there's an expectation um, to empower people um, to grow and to, to move themselves forward and to support them on that journey. And you talk a lot about emotional empowerment. Um, Can you tell us just a little bit, like, what does that mean to you, this idea of emotional empowerment? Sure. Well, I, I think first and foremost, especially when I'm working with corporations, organizations, and so forth, there's a, a lot of talk about managing emotions because I'm working with leaders or managers and they're experiencing others' emotions, what I call come out sideways, and they feel overwhelmed by that. They're like, oh my goodness, I get the call. Michelle, help us. These emotions are coming out all over the place. And, and so, and they always ask, can you help us manage our emotions better? And managing emotions, I liken that to when you have a weed in your garden and you pick the weed from like the top of, of, of the, of the, sure. of them versus it, which, okay, it, it kind of goes away. It might help it grow back slower a little bit, but we're not getting to the root. And so emotional empowerment is guiding you to understand that we have this whole spectrum of different feelings for a reason. And the reason is, is that each feeling is pointing out to you a different psychological need that is going unmet. And it's our job, our personal responsibility, because the emotion is coming within us to address that psychological need for ourselves. And so when we learn to understand that, uh, that for instance, if three of us witness a car accident, one person feels guilty, one feels anxious, one feels anger by it. The reason why each person is triggered in a different way is because that is providing information about what psychological need is not being met and what they can specifically do to move forward, to meet that need and, and then feel at ease again. So that rather than managing just the symptom, we're getting to the root. And when you address the root, you automatically ah, start to feel like, okay, I, 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 I understand why this has come forward. And now I feel empowered 
A, because I took personal responsibility for how I feel, and B, I showed up in a way that oftentimes stretches us to go outside our comfort zone, go outside how we would normally react, and instead show up in our more truest, empowered leader version of ourselves. Wow. I love that. I love that. Um, so tell me this, uh, when you're th- when you're working with your clients, um, I know that uh, primarily you're working with folks um, at the manager or higher level. Um, but when all you're working all over, okay, good. Yep, all so, over. do you use the same type of? I mean, is it kind of like I can I can walk you through a process regardless of who you are, um, kind of you know what your rank and serial number is, uh, so to speak, um, this process works kind of for everybody as you walk through a process, the process. Absolutely. Absolutely. We, we have an essentials training, which I say is for, you know, really anyone employee wide, uh, people short on time, college students, this gets you the the nuts and bolts of <laughs> really starting to understand the emotion, uh, the language of our emotions, because we haven't been taught the, the language of our emotions or how to work with it in an empowered way. And then I invite managers, leaders, HR teams, or people who just always loved psychology <laughs> to go into my more advanced program where we can get more into some of some more details, some more aspects to not only support your own emotional processing, but that advanced training helps people in terms of communication, how to recognize your own emotional triggers and blind spots, because we cannot teach psychological safety without first addressing our own emotional blind spots. Otherwise those emotions come out sideways on their team without people even knowing it. Yes. Thank you. Yes. (laughs) So the advanced is more, you're doing more inner work as well as how to understand how to commute with, communicate with someone when they're expressing anxiety, anger, disappointment, in a way that will lead them to their own empowered uh, process. I love that. You know, I'm, as you're talking, I'm just thinking about, obviously some, we do similar work, right? Yeah. And, and that's, um, I was thrilled you, you were able to take the Dignify snapshot and, and, uh, and learn a little bit about one of the tools that, that we use here. And as I'm thinking about some of the things that you're saying, I can't help but kind of jump back to our snapshot and kind of the, the way that people are able to explain to other people, this is this is what drives me. This is who I am. You know, a little bit about who I am and not, not necessarily just what I do, right? Um, yes. We're so focused on what we do. And, 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 you know, I love what I do. I love that I get to do what I do. But it is not necessarily all that I am. You know, and so to be able to express, um, express yourself, share those things of what drives me, what motivates me, you know, what's that way that I really appreciate being spoken to because we're, because we all come from different places, right? We all come from different experiences, different backgrounds, and we're different people. And it's not necessarily right or wrong or good or bad, but just different, right? We're just different. And so we communicate differently. Um, And I know some of the things that you're talking about, the thing that comes to my mind has a lot to do with emotional intelligence, right? We throw the word around a lot. Probably over the last three years, it's been a hot, you know, a hot commodity um, when it comes to when it comes to words. But emotional intelligence is really a journey. You know, it's again, you're not necessarily born with it, right? You have to grow it. Um, You have to work at it. And this is a a piece that I just think, wow, this is such a a wonderful way that you can grow your emotional intelligence and being able to understand how do I cope with life around me? How do I help others cope with their life around them through this idea of emotional empowerment? I just think it's really, it's just cool. Any, any, any thoughts about that connection between what you're doing and this, this idea of emotional intelligence? Oh, absolutely. I, I, I think there's so many uh, powerful aspects 
that uh, emotional intelligence really opened the door in corporations to say, hey, our emotions matter. And that was huge when there's, because there's still organizations and some leaders that say there's no room for emotions in the workplace. Right. So the, right. the fact that we, we brought in research to say, actually, this is impacting productivity, this is impacting how we communicate conflict, so forth, it, uh, our, our ability to be present, to make decisions, and all of that it has been huge. I think where this the next stage is growing is that we have to address what people are saying they're struggling with in the workplace, which according to Deloitte's latest mental health survey, 80% of employees are saying they are experiencing some mental uh, health symptom, yeah. which if we drill that down is, is an unprocessed emotion. Yeah. And so where I always say our next stages is, is really shifting from learning how to manage emotions and regulate emotions that, that is powerful, that is needed. But if we want to get to really helping people with their emotional and mental well-being, we have to under we have to give them the opportunity to understand what is going on for themselves emotionally. And it simply hasn't been taught. And so if they learn along with everything that you're doing, which is amazing, like, hey, these are my communication styles. This is what I appreciate. This is what is what doesn't work for me. If we have tools like that, along with, oh, and what do I do when I'm feeling disappointed in myself or it, or I'm feeling anxious or someone comes to me and they're angry, they didn't get a promotion. If we combine these aspects of communication tools with emotional tools and understanding the specifics to what our emotions are telling us, we just pop the lid off of really trying to create everything that organizations are trying to create, which is more team cohesiveness, uh, teams uh, feeling like their culture has improved because they feel cared about that we're listening to their emotional needs. So yes, we've got to continue to do things like address um, uh, too much workload and, and overworking our people. At the same time, I've worked with organizations where People are so committed to their jobs that they're willing to do that as long as their organization demonstrates to them that they really care about their emotional health and well-being. So um, they it, it, and if we really care about people, we can't continue to have just these long stretches of just <laughs> piling work on people. But people are willing to go the extra distance if they feel cared for either organization and they believe in the organization um, uh, purpose and what that organization is, how they're here to make an impact. You know, I appreciate when, when you talked about people will go the extra mile. <laughs> people um, want to have a sense of ownership um, where they work. They want it to matter and mean more you know, to them, you know, above themselves, right? Um, being able to be a part of something that is larger than yourself and, you know, some of those kinds of things. But we do have to find a unique balance. And there's a lot of talk right now about this idea of um, equity versus equality, um, the idea of, right, this the ever-changing work-life balance. We, around here, we, can't, we don't really call it work-life balance. We just call it life. <laughs> I was going to say the same thing, right? right. It's just kind of <laughs> life, you know, and, um, and we all have one and it's important, you know, as leaders to understand that we have a life outside of work, certainly. Um, and, and that we have to balance it among many different things, not ne even necessarily just our family and work, but other passions that we have, um, being a, a, a member of a community, you know, all those kinds of things. And we have to remember that, just like we have it, the people that we work with and the people that we lead and the people that have been put um, in our charge, right, to take care of, have a life. <laughs> and they have things they have to balance, right? Um, whether that's an ailing parent, whether that's a, a child 
that that needs some, you know, some extra attention, whatever it might be, it's important to them, right? And so this idea of being able to recognize that we are not the only ones <laughs> in this picture that might have some things that come up, but the people that we the people that we lead have a lot of that as well. And we sometimes don't know, right? We sometimes don't have any idea what's happening in their lives. And I think, you know, the art of dialogue, I was I was out um, east uh, this last uh, just a, this last week and um, doing some training. And as I was doing some some training with with a client, I had this thought, Uh, that came over me of, I wonder how many people actually talk like we're doing right now, just on a regular day, right? Just on a Wednesday when I'm not there being all in their business, you know? Um, What is everybody, what's everybody talking about? And the reality is that we have, we have lost in many ways the drive to communicate and talk to people to just have conversation with people, right? And so I said to to the groups of leaders that I had, I said, you know what? I got to tell you, if the only thing you take (laughs) from this training is this, please start talking to each other. Start communicating with each other. And you coming from um, your background with with your your psychology background um, and so many people that you've worked with um, throughout your career, how important is it to just start talking? Oh, it, it, it's it's vital. It's vital to our overall health because we want connection. It, it's a part of our our human tendency to want to connect with others. And I think what we're speaking to when people don't communicate to others, there's also, we're also mirroring back a disconnect with ourselves. Mm. Um, We've got to also be willing, like you said, we we can become so afraid of those quiet moments of the time when we're right before bed and uh, you're starting to settle down. That's when people's mind starts racing because everything that really internally wants their attention has the space to come forward and it comes rushing forward and people don't know what to do with it. And so it's by making time to connect with ourselves so that we we know our truth that we better know ourselves. We become better communicators with others. It becomes easier to communicate with others because we're really allowing ourselves to be vulnerable with ourselves. Mm-hmm. And that's how we can really make truer, deeper connections with others when we're willing to be vulnerable, when we're willing to put down the masks of having it all together, we can really connect on a human level. Um, And when we are able to gain greater ease with all our emotions and the spectrum of emotions that we have, we can have greater uh, connection as well as compassion and empathy for others. Mm, I love that. You use the V word vulnerability. (laughs) Joe has a a video that we, that we shot um, called the sea of vulnerability. Um, And we talk, you'll appreciate it because you live, uh, you live by Lake Michigan. And it's a a story where he talks about vulnerability in retrospect to Lake Michigan. And and the fact that Lake Michigan is so dang cold, right? (laughs) Like it's so cold. (laughs) And that, that this idea of even in July, you know, oh, yeah. it's, it's just still cold. Right. It and really so is. when you, when you walk into it, you, you have to wait for your feet to kind of get used to it. Right. And your body to get used to the cold, you know, and that's kind of like, that's a little bit of vulnerability, you know, and as you get in uh, and you go in a little bit, a little bit farther, you know, you're about mid, you know, mid calf up to the knee and you're like, Ooh, this is cold, you know, and that woo probably gets a little bit higher as you, as you go a little bit deeper. And we talk about vulnerability for leaders, you know, is somewhere between the knee and the mid thigh, right? I love you that. know, getting vulnerable. We, we, we need to be vulnerable as leaders. And, and so, you know, what does that really look like? And we talk about, you know, you kind of get used to it, but Joe says, but I ain't Duncan. 
I, <laughs> like, you know, if you've ever been in Lake Michigan, you know, it is so cold when you dunk, oh. right? Oh, you don't go in until August. You don't yeah. go in until <laughs> August. I love it. And so this whole idea, right, of just having some levels and some balance of vulnerability, you know, a lot of times for leaders and, and really just anybody, when they think in order to be vulnerable, I have to, like, I have to just do the polar plunge, you know, oh, right yeah. in, and it has, and it has to be everything. And, and I think, no, in fact, that, that, that might be, you know, now we're a little extreme, right? We're on the extremes, yes. right? But there's, there is a balance to vulnerability and it's okay for leaders to have balances. It's okay to have boundaries as leaders. Um, but we do have to be able to find that mix for our team. Absolutely. Yes. We want to be able to connect with our emotional states, but we don't want to pour out our emotional states on others. So that that's the connection piece when we can say, you know, oh, I've been there. That's made me anxious, too. Or, yes, there's some uncertainty, but you're not just in this spin of uncertainty and unloading that on others. You're able to. That's, again, the, the piece of being able to process what does this uncertainty mean to me? So I can go forward with vulnerability saying, yes, this has brought me uncertainty too. And by leaning into this emotion and understanding it from an empowered lens, this is what is guiding me to understand. And so it actually makes us better leaders because we can connect with what everyone else on the team is feeling, yet also have a model as to, well, oh, this is what we do with it. And it leads people forward. You know, I worked with organizations before uh, the pandemic, and they just got off of all these layoffs back at that time, and they didn't want to address the elephant in the room, or they addressed it once that people were grieving, missing their colleagues, and they were like, okay, we don't know what to do anymore. And so uh, it really takes that leadership to say, yes, I've experienced this this grieving as well, this loss. And this is what my grief is teaching me. This is what it's telling me of what I need to do and how we can move forward. And that connects people rather than tells them, okay, we address this once we're done. Let's move on. It just, people don't work like that. I love that. That's a great example. And I was, I was about to ask you, like, give me some examples or some experiences that you have had um, in terms of just the work that you're doing with this idea of empowerment, um, and how do you see how do you see that going? I mean, how is it going? I think it's a little uh, bit of a new concept. It is, it is, and that's what makes it really fun because um, when we do this employee wide, I think um, well, we just get messages that this is life changing for people, and I, I, I say that with humility because. Um, it, you know, I know that people have done a lot of inner work. I think a lot of times we just haven't known what to do exactly with specific feelings. We just haven't been taught that. And so we get these messages like, I've been doing therapy and that's great, but I've gained more insight through, you know, this training than in six months of therapy, which is, you know, again, not a con against therapy. We want to have that individual piece to Absolutely. work things out. But I think People are looking for that information. What do the heck do I do with these feelings? I think they're really yearning for that. So employee-wide, um, we get great feedback with that. With managers and leaders, it, it's just this sense of relief of, um, okay, phew, I can, I can approach others now when they're experiencing anxiety or anger and not feel it's almost like people previously were acting like they never had these emotions yeah. <laughs> and they would tiptoe yeah. around they didn't want to offend and so it's really just giving people a framework to say first of all let's break this down like we have these feelings all the time and this is how we can start to work with them and when you learn to do that in a way that feels comfortable for you as a leader, when you start to under the, understand that for yourself, you gain greater insight into your team, into others. And so we're hearing from people that this has increased uh, conflict, improved communication, 
um, helped a sense of cohesiveness, made them feel like uh, the company culture, that they they feel that they matter. So we're really hearing some some positive things, along with, of course, helping them uh, um, diminish their emotional overwhelm and, and so forth. So we're, it's really exciting. Yes. Yes. Thanks for asking. Yes. I love it. I love it. I I knew, you know, I remember meeting you when um, at the the women's at a women's conference. And I remember you came in and folks, <clears throat> this girl came in in a yellow suit that was like drop dead had to have. I was like, I need to meet this girl. I need to meet this girl. She's coming in with a yellow suit. That's my favorite color by the way. And, but I was like, she came in and she was like, this is me. Like, this is me. I am who I am. And I thought I want to know her story. Um, it was just that connection right away. And I, and I was so glad that we were able to reach out and, and, uh, and be able to have you come on and, and just, and just share because it was such value. What you shared at the, at the, at the women's conference was so valuable. Um, and it got me, just got me thinking a little bit more about this idea of empowerment and what does it really mean? And, and, and really empowering us to feel that it was okay to have emotion. Um, and as a person who is an emotional person, um, it was like, oh, thank you. Like, in some ways, it just kind of gave me a little, like, gave me a little room to breathe a little bit. Aww. And and so I really, I do, I really appreciate it. And I and I just hope the very best for you. I, I just think what you're doing is so cool. Um, and I hope that, like, we get to do this again or get to be at, at conferences again, or, you know, those types of things. And we get to continue to do what clearly we love to do, um, which is, which is, um, being able to help people and uh, being able to help them come come to terms of, of just loving who they are and and accepting who they are. Um, and so I love that. So thank you so much for it. Um, I want to give you a chance. How do people reach you? How do people get in, um, in contact with you if they're interested? Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for that, April. And uh, I am excited by this. And just remember that our, our negative emotions are our allies. That is like, and I say that with uh, with understanding that people are struggling and I've been there in the struggle and I've supported people through the struggle and I promise they're here to help us feel better. So if that resonates for you, please uh, check out our training. You go to training. So it stands for International Institute for Emotional Empowerment. That's I-I-E-E. But that's a mouthful, so we just abbreviated it. I-I-E-E dot training, no dot com. Uh, and you'll find us there and what we're up to. And, um, and I'd love to connect with people if this resonates. That's awesome. Well, you are a delight. And, oh, and right thank you so people. much. <laughs> thank you so much. I appreciate the time. And uh, and everyone else, thanks for joining us today. Um, don't fear, Joe will be back. He'll be back from vacation for the next one. Um, and don't let him know if I did anything that was secret. Don't let him know. Um, so it has been lots of fun. It's been great to have you here with the Dignity Dialogues. Keep on dignifying. We'll talk to you soon. Bye now. This has been the Dignity Dialogue with Joe Kittinger. Talk at you later.